Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, so to start with the podcast today, and Rob want to share a really interesting story with us. The story is that I was in a training, and there were maybe about seventy people in this training, and all of them worked. In the same English school, but half of them were Chinese, half of them were foreigners. Where is it?、Uh, it's in Shanghai,、oh, okay. right in this big lecture theatre, and this is training about how to use spreadsheets or something. The lecturer was from Mexico. He had an accent, but I could understand him perfectly. Anyway, something interesting happened about two thirds of the way through the day. The Chinese people in the audience couldn't understand it. And、so when you say the Chinese audience, are they English teachers? Some、or? of them are English teachers. Some of them are managers. But basically, all of them were using English every day for work. And all of them, you know, there were some people I knew that had worked in an English language school for like five years or ten years,、oh, right?、Okay. So they're they're speaking to they're speaking in English every、mm-hmm. day. What I realized was that because these people were having to listen to an accent that they didn't recognize, they couldn't understand,、mm-hmm. right? Even、mm-hmm. though they've got this really really high level of listening, right?、Mm-hmm. And they're able to communicate with. "Quote unquote" native speakers all the time.、Mm-hmm. They couldn't understand this lecture because he was from Mexico. Okay. So, anyway, <laughs> so today we're going to talk about English as a lingua franca. Tracy, what's English as a lingua franca, or what does that mean to you?、Um, no, I think it's just a language which is used by different people who speak different language, and they use this language. <laughs> it's a language by people who speak different languages, and, <laughs> and they're language. using the same language to communicate. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so it's basically this idea that I think if you go back, maybe. What fifty years or something? There was a British Empire. All the world was learning English, but they were learning English from this point of view that, like you know, the British, who were the the masters and the controllers、mm-hmm. of the whole world, were、mm-hmm. forcing people to speak English, right? <clears throat> and you have the Second World War and nineteen fifties and the nineteen sixties. A lot of these countries, India, Burma, etc., etc., get their independence. And if you move on to the present day, and the, the same with a lot of Africa as well, right? A lot of African countries、uh, were under British rule. If you move on to now, we have the situation where a lot of the world is using English to communicate with each other, and all of a sudden, this idea of English as being like owned by Britain has changed, right? Because over the over the years, the number of non-native speakers, right, non-British or non-Americans or non-Australians who speak English. Has gone bigger and bigger and bigger. So now we're in the situation of saying, "Well, who owns English?、Mm. What counts as being right or, or being wrong?"、Mm-hmm. So, for example, right, if you have, and I don't know how many, just say it's three、uh, hundred million people in in India who can speak English. Can someone British say that their English is wrong?、Mm. There's like, I think it's the same situation in China because you know it's very common for the teacher and then. You know, being asked by the te-、uh, students, "Oh, okay, teacher, I'd like to improve my English. I want to study American English or British English only."、Um, so now you think about the number of people who speak British English or American English is much smaller than the non-native English speakers. And the people the who speak Chinglish. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's quite interesting. Like last year, I attended like a meeting or conference, and there was a Chinese f- professor and talking about.、Um, You know something similar, like oh, you we, we we shouldn't teach like British or American English, and we should teach them like even Aussie English or New Zealand English or Chinglish to the students, because in the future they're not only talk to the people from those countries; they're talking about people from all over the world. So it's I think this is an interesting point to consider as teachers, like what well, what do your students want、mm-hmm. to sound like, and why do they want to、mm-hmm. sound like that? And、yeah. uh, I remember years ago meeting some professors from. I think they were from Cambridge or from Oxford or something. Come to China or to come to Shanghai to do some Q and A session with a bunch of directors of studies, and they got onto this topic. And I think one of them was from Greece or France. I can't remember. And anyway, she said, "I don't want to sound British or American when I speak English. Do you know why?、Mm-hmm. Because I'm not British or American, <laughs> right? I'm from Greece. I、yeah. don't want to. I want to sound Greek when I、mm. speak English, right?" And I think what's one of the interesting things about students choosing a, an accent is your accent says so much about you. When I speak English, or I think when British people speak English, it says not only about where you're from, but it also says that where you were educated, possibly in the, the class that your parents are from. So there's a lot kind of in your own identity that's wrapped up in your accent. Oh, interesting. 
I read about a study a long time ago. Someone did some research and they played these Japanese learners of English a bunch of different accents. And they said, you know, here's 20 accents, different, 20 different people speaking English, and they're all from different places. Which one of these people would you most like to sound like? Mm. Can you guess which accent they chose? I don't know. Ja- yeah, they chose a Japanese, Japanese. person oh, okay. speaking English. I think it's worth, like, for teachers that we don't just make this assumption that our students want to sound like us, Mm -hmm. but also, one, that might not be a realistic goal for them, Mm -hmm. but two, yeah, they they might not want us to fix all the pronunciation Mm -hmm. errors because they might still want to sound, maybe errors is the wrong Mm -hmm. word to use there, but yeah, Mm -hmm. our students might not necessarily want to sound like us. But the interesting thing is when we are teaching, because yeah. according to my teaching experience, and we were teaching some like lower level classes, yeah. and you know some of the companies and just schedule the classes particularly for like a Chinese teachers. Um, they're teaching lower level students like beginner and elementary, and yeah. then international teachers they're teaching higher levels because they believe native speakers. Native speakers, yeah. yeah. So I think that's the whole thing. And it's really hard to change people's perception or their belief. And okay, different teacher doesn't matter. And I should understand a different accent and who has different background. It definitely affects the teacher's confidence. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if you remember at the very beginning when I became a trainer and I uh-huh. mentioned to you, oh, I'm not very confident because yeah. I think I'm a Chinese, I'm not native English speaker. If I give a presentation or go to conference, I don't think people would believe my idea. So I'm not confident to, to give a presentation to a lot of native speakers. Right. But I'm sure I told you at the time, like whenever mm-hmm. I go to an international mm-hmm. conference or I went to TESOL International mm-hmm. a couple of years ago and half of the plenary speeches were by Chinese people. So mm-hmm. I think different mm-hmm. places kind of view that differently. Uh, you, you, you talk about the Japanese uh, people and their, mm. you know, the study that they read about. Um, it reminds me of... Like in my university, and we did a project with the students in a Japanese university. Oh. One module is about like an accent and how oh. you can be understood. I remember each week we talk each other through Skype, and then we try to record our conversation. When we come back, we have to do analysis and see how much that you had difficulty to understand and how Sounds much that you understand each other and why you could understand each other and why you didn't understand each right. other. Right. And what so did you find? I realized actually the element of factors understanding is not the accent, it's not the language, it's about the background and the culture concept. Right. For example, mm-hmm. maybe they introduce something which we have never exposed before in China. So we just didn't understand. Oh, ah, so it's not versa. so much about the, the accent, language, right? Yeah, it's, it's about, about the about concepts and the context. Exactly. Yeah, oh, it's not really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something I think it's worth mentioning here is that some scholars have tried to redefine this into I think it's like three separate. We call them circles. One's called the inner circles, and so this is all your native speaking countries: Britain, America, Australia. And then the outer circle is maybe countries like Nigeria or maybe the Philippines, right? Where it's not anyone's first language. But lots of people will learn it at school or be educated in it. And it might be an official language of the government, Mm -hmm. right? And then you have countries like, I think, for example, in China, where very few people maybe are educated in English. But if you believe the China Daily, then something like 300 million people Mm -hmm. in China are either speaking English or Mm -hmm. learning to speak English. You know, earlier we were talking about the different accents. So yeah. If this is not that important, if we can make sure everybody understands each other, what's the point we spend a lot of time and energy focused on phonology and you know talking about like connect speech and everything? I think one of the implications of all this is at the very least you need to focus on like listening skills, like phonology sub skills. Mm. Okay, so maybe your students don't need to master all this connected speech aspects of phonology in my opinion for a lot of students it's not actually that important and as you say if it's someone chinese speaking to someone japanese if they can use connected speech or not maybe isn't that important Mm -hmm. but what is more important i think is practicing listening skills so Mm -hmm. i think for me the implication of all this is that teachers bring in listening into the classroom that isn't the prescribed listening from the course book and that they find examples of non-native speakers speaking English and they do listening activities on those Mm -hmm. and help students like pick out phonological patterns that are with those because otherwise you end up with that situation like we were talking about earlier Mm. with um yeah someone Mexican speaking and you have all these people who think that they're Mm. they can speak English perfectly 
and someone Mexican stands up in front of them and they've got no idea yeah. what they're saying in English. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And now we, we focus on like English as a lingua franca. So for the next 20, 50 years, do you believe in English is still going to be <laughs> the language you know, everybody in the world chooses to communicate? I guess there's some different schools of thought on this. One, one of the ideas is that there's no such thing as English. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we shouldn't think of English as one language, but we should think of English as almost like different dialects of English. Yeah. Obviously, we sometimes talk about American English mm-hmm. or Scottish English, but we now need to start thinking of Indian English, Chinese English. So all these different types of English, we can almost look at as being different dialects mm-hmm. and treat them as that. However, it's also worth saying that there are some scholars that think that's completely wrong and mm-hmm. think that there's no patterns in it. All these aspects of the different dialects are actually just errors. So not not everyone agrees with that. Yeah. So I think that that's one way that it it seems like it's likely to mm-hmm. develop. Yeah, I think it's a, like a long term thing, not just one day or one week. You know, teachers or students and completely change their behavior and their idea or mentality towards the language. But I think it's something definitely worth considering, and when we're teaching and learning. Okay, to finish our conversation today, and English as a lingua franca. So, any key points that would like to give us? I, I guess for me, the main things are that one, don't assume that your students want to sound like you. Two is don't assume that your model of English is the only model of English. The third thing, really, really important, is expose your students to as broad a variety of different accents as possible, and、mm-hmm. make sure that they're aware of all those different patterns of different types of English, and at least、mm-hmm. get them used to listening to different、mm-hmm. accents. Because if your students can only understand British and Americans, then Probably seventy percent of the time, when they're、mm. in the real world, that's not going to be much help.、Mm. And、um, just be proud of your own accent and your own dialect when you're speaking English.、Uh, be confident. Yeah. Great. Thanks,、okay. Tracy. Thank you, Ross. Bye-bye, bye, bye, everyone.